Welcome to church. St. Andrew's Carroll has some celebrations, and this week it is happy birthday to Aubrey on December 26th. Boy, it's neat to see you growing up, Aubrey. Youth group. The St. Andrew's Carroll's last youth group will be on Monday, tomorrow, December 21st. Uh, it'll be virtual Zoom meeting from 6.30 till about 8. And then the group will meet again in the new year on Monday, January 4th and January 18th. Again on Zoom. Um, and there's a big thank you to myself and to Cheryl for continuing to find fun and engaging ways to keep our youth connected. Hope Youth Group is going to meet next on January 7th. That's Thursday, January 7th at 6 to 8 p.m. As far as the Christmas Eve service, our in-person service will be held at 6.30 for St. Andrew's Carol. Uh, for those that have reserved a seat, for worshiping online, the service will be posted on our YouTube channel at Hope St. Andrew's Churches on December 24th, and a link will be mailed to you once it's available sometime that morning, likely, or the night before. Hope, uh, Hope Christmas Eve service is at 8 p.m., uh, we have a very few seats left, 519-464-8456, uh, text to reserve your seats, and annual reports need to be starting to get done. Even in COVID, we still have annual reports. January 10th uh, is when St. Andrew's Carroll would like theirs in, and I know Hope would like ours in about the same time or a couple days later. The annual meeting at St. Andrew's Carroll will be Sunday, January 31st. Now. More details about how and when we're meeting, whether it'll be a Zoom meeting or an in-person meeting or a combination of both, and what time it will be still has to be announced. We're waiting to see what the, what the situation is. As far as Hope Annual Meeting, it'll be the following week on Sunday, February 7th. After church, you're to bring your own bag lunch and others can join by Zoom if you wish. Today, we are premiering our Old Fashioned Community Christmas Concert. It is scheduled to be premiered at 2 p.m., uh, but it can be watched anytime after that, and we will be letting people see it and uh, tell your friends and neighbors, uh, because a bunch of your friends and neighbors are going to be in it. We got lots of acts, and so of all ages, of all stages of life, and of all abilities. Um, so come and enjoy, and it'll help put you in the Christmas spirit, even if you're still at home. Thank you for listening to the announcements. Let us worship God on this Sunday, right before uh, Christmas Day.
Walter says, it is a thrill and good feeling when another pays attention to us more than others and makes us feel special. But the Bible says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Love is choosing to love and care for another, especially if it costs you. Out of love for the people of God, the Lord chooses to come to us in Jesus, born through an impossible birth, born of a virgin. This is to be a sign for us, to be able to recognize the Messiah has come. Hear from Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 to 14. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, your house of David, it is not enough to try the patience of humans. Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a son, the virgin, will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. We like this last purple candle to remind us that love, true love, is not a feeling but a choice. God has chosen to come and love us in Jesus Emmanuel. To remind us that when we want to know God, all we need to do is look at Jesus. We like the last purple candle and place this cross by the manger as a sign of the cost of God's love for us. Let us pray. God of hope, Prince of peace, Jubilee judge, and Lord of love, your goodness is beyond our wildest imaginings. You give us more than we can think to ask, coming to us with impossible possibility in the union of flesh and spirit. Teach us to love this world and all people as you love us in Jesus Christ our Lord. God of promise, God of hope, into our darkness come. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the promise from Isaiah that a sign that you are coming to us will be when a virgin gives birth to a child. And so, Lord, you came to us 2,000 years ago gently in a manger, and so you still come to us gently in the waters of baptism and in the blood of communion, also in the gentle way that still powerfully changes us into your people. Lord, we ask that you would continue to do the good work you've begun in us as you lovingly change us and help us to grow into your people of love. Today as we worship, help us to better understand how you come in gentleness and not in force of coercion. Help us to love our neighbors with your kind of gentleness, we pray. In the meantime, we thank you for our blessings, for the many and variety acts that have submitted for our old-fashioned community Christmas concert that will be premiered today, for the fantastic turnout last Saturday at the Reverse Christmas Parade, and for all the help uh, that I had to set up and take down the float. For uh, one of our uh, youth, uh, Matthew, for getting his grade uh, 12 secondary school graduation diploma along with about four different awards YMCA, Brook Telecom, Optimist and Local Fairboard. We also thank you God for the new vaccine uh, for the virus and the success some older meds are starting to have in treating it. And yet Lord despite your blessings we humans still tend towards the sin of wanting our own way and trying to coerce others to join us. Forgive us for these sins or any other sins that come to our mind and understanding. Lord, hear our prayers of confession. Forgiving God, 
Help us to continue to grow and follow your calling and show and tell others your strong, gentle love. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Welcome to Storytime. Now today, which kind of candle did we light? It was the candle of love. That's right. Often people think about changing the world and making it more loving. They think they want to, well, make people do things. Sometimes they use nonviolent protests. Look at this picture. Sometimes people will use violent protests. Look at this picture. And in even extreme cases, it's actual war. Look at this picture of some soldiers. But you know what? When Jesus came, when God came to us in Jesus to change the world, he didn't come that way. He came humbly in a, in a manger. Some angels announced it to some shepherds. And the shepherds spread that message around. And then eventually a star drew some magi with special gifts to help Jesus and his family have the resources they would need. You see, ultimately love, the love of God is never coercive. Love doesn't force people. In fact, you know how the stories of Meshach, Shachrach, and Abednego, the fiery furnace, and Daniel and the lion's den took, care and took, took place in Babylon and Persia? Well, when the people came back to Jerusalem after being carried off into captivity, this is how the Lord said they would do it. The prophet said this to Jerubbabel and the returnees. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might nor by my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And then he goes on to say, Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple, and his hands will also complete it. 
then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. You see, God does things not by might nor by power, but by the working of his Holy Spirit. And that power is released when we trust in God and his love grows in and through us and around us and gets shared amongst us. So let's pray that God will help us to adapt and to love people gently and not with coercion or force or violence. Because that's the kind of love God has for us and that's the kind of love he wants us to have for each other and even the difficult people around us. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for loving us and coming to us in such a gentle way as a stable and in a barn. Lord, your kingdom grows not with violence of coercion, but through the love and service of, done, of service done gently and kindly. Please, Lord, grow your loving gentleness within each one of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture reading, the first one, is from 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 to 12. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We accept a person's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is a te the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar, because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony God has given us, eternal life. And this is in his Son. Sorry, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Our second scripture reading is from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, the birth of Jesus foretold. 
In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Our psalm reading today is taken from Psalm 23, probably the most famous psalm in the whole Bible. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He lies, lays me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
Let us listen to God's message to us today as we pray. Let us pray. Lord, as we look into the scriptures and continue to work through 1 John and think about this Christmas season, help us to grow in your kind of love. Help us to realize and understand that your love is not coercive, but it's gentle and kind. And help us reflect your kind of love so that we might experience you at work in our lives even this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So on this fourth Sunday of Advent, we lit the candle of love. And as we talked about last week, real deep love is doing things that cost us deeply. And so we use the story, uh, The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry, a short story about Della selling her hair to buy a watch chain, and Jim, her husband, selling his watch to buy Della some combs for her hair. And so God chose to love us. And somehow, he chose to love us enough that he became, in Jesus, a real live human being. Understanding how God, the creator of the universe, could enter into his own creation is a little bit of a mystery to us human creatures. It is, in some ways, outside our understanding, just as it was outside Mary's understanding, how she was going to give birth to the Messiah, even though she was a virgin. And yet God seems to have really done what was impossible for us and to us. In fact, that five centuries before uh, hand, Isaiah the prophet said that a virgin was going to have a child would be a sign to the people. And this child would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us, might be a hint that this has been planned for a long time. And while it may be difficult for our human minds to understand how such a thing could happen, when we look at the teachings of Scripture, once we accept what seems to be hard to understand, then virtually all the teachings of Scriptures fit together so perfectly. And it makes sense. For example, the Lord is our shepherd in the Old Testament in Psalm 23. And then in John's Gospel in the New Testament, Jesus says that he is the good shepherd. He takes up all God's authority and role. Jesus is also described in the New Testament in Colossians 1.15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus tells Philip, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And earlier in John 8.58, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. Now, why did they pick up stones to stone Jesus? Because the name I am, the name Jesus was calling himself, is Yahweh in Hebrew. Jehovah, God. It's the name of God. So that when Moses was at the burning bush and said, What's your name, God? He says, I am who I am. So Jesus was not just claiming to be any God, but the God of the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Lord God, the God of the Bible. And then in John 10, verses 30 to 33, he says, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to them, I've shown you many good works from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? We are stoning you. We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So according to the New Testament, Jesus is somehow come to us, is how God somehow has come to us. And so when we want to know about God or understand God or know God, we look to and listen to Jesus. Essentially, this is why as disciples of Jesus, we, we are actually called Christians. And this might have cost the Lord something very big and significant that we have trouble understanding. Because as according to Philippians, it says, Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be uh, used to his own advantage, but rather made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, a human being, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even 
death on a cross. God's coming to us was a great act of sacrificial love. He became human, and not only that, he died on the cross for our sins. So the question then arises, what good does Jesus coming to earth approximately 2,000 years ago do for us today? Well, listen to our reading from 1 John chapter 5, verse 6. This is the one who came by water and the blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and the blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. What does this all refer to? When Jesus comes by water and blood, John is simply referring to the sacraments, the water of baptism and the blood of the blood and the body, the body and blood of Jesus in communion. In other words, Jesus doesn't come to us and our lives 2,000 years ago, rise to the Father and then leave us on our own. In fact, just as before his ascension in Matthew's Gospel, he promises to be with us forever. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. And so Jesus promises to be with to us, not only to the end of the age, the end of the world. So we are to hold, told that he comes to us somehow, mysteriously, in the sacraments of baptism, celebrating new birth, spiritual birth, and that happens when we believe in him and follow him, and then Jesus' ongoing presence and forgiveness as Christ comes to us in the sacrament of communion, where we repeatedly invite Jesus to be in our lives, helping us and guiding us and empowering us. So this is why, as believing Christians, we practice baptism and communion. And the promise is that as we practice this worship in these sacraments, we end up getting changed. You know, there's an idea out there that God and humanity are at odds with each other. And it is only as we offer God our worship and sacrifice that we change his mind so that he doesn't hate us or curse us, but that he loves us. However, in Jewish and Christian thought, the Lord God, the great I Am, already loves us. And he has come to us in Jesus, for us as Christians, and in the sacraments to change our hearts and minds. So it's not that worship, we have to change God's mind to love us. It's that we are reshaped and changed so that we love God. So that when we sing and we praise the Lord, as we read the scriptures and the stories of God from the Bible, as we pray and celebrate baptism and communion, somehow this all mysteriously reshapes us. How we think and how we live our lives. And often the change is so slow that we don't notice anything. Kind of like after you haven't seen a family member for a while, they say, my, how you've grown and changed. You know, this is the Christmas season, and normally we would all be getting together and seeing people that we wouldn't see for a long time. Now, my family has decided we're going to see each other by Zoom, virtually, even if we can't be together in person. But you know at those annual family gatherings, some great aunt comes up to you and says, Oh my, how you've grown in this last year. Well, that's the way growth happens. Now some of you may be thinking, Jim, these are sound finding words, but is any of this real? And my answer is, check this out for yourself. Because it is my experience that as we worship God and practice the sacraments, People's lives are changed. You know, I've told this story to those of you who are regulars, but I'm going to tell it again because it's still true. A friend of mine, Dr. David Haskell, a sociologist of religion at Wilfrid Laurier University, reports that looking at Statistics Canada's numbers, he can see how people who are in regular worship give away just about three times as much money as the average Canadian in offerings or giving to uh, non-profit organizations for income tax deductions. And not only that, 
but we volunteer about twice as much time because we attend worship. Now, you regular folks have heard me repeat this information over and over again, and why do I keep telling you? Because so many people don't think it's true. They don't understand the importance and the value of attending worship. That's one of the reasons during COVID-19 I've gone to so much work to try and have these online services. So Jesus doesn't just come to us in the past, he still comes to us now in and through the sacraments and worship. And what is interesting is that as we live in a time where power and might are often celebrated as the tools to change the world, whether it's through protests or outright war, however, when the loving God, the creator of the universe, chose to come to change the world, he came in a manger as a helpless baby. You see, love, God's love in particular, is never coercive. It is persuasive, but it never forces people to do anything. When we come to God in worship, celebrating baptism and communion, it really looks like, on a human level, almost nothing is happening that can be measured with our five senses. It seems, well, ordinary. And yet, as I suggested, the sociological research tells us that something really is happening that can be measured as our attitudes and behaviors are shaped and changed. But again, our God never comes with force, but with gentleness and with love. An Old Testament story and teaching that I mentioned in the story time is that as God convinced some Persian kings like Cyrus and Darius to let Zerubbabel lead any Jews who wanted to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple, when they went back, there was no conflict like when the Israelites left Egypt and they have the ten plagues. In this case, they were allowed to go, and even some of the money from the royal treasury of Persia was used to help rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And so Zechariah the prophet said this to, do, to Zerubbabel, the leader, and the returnees. He said, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, mighty mountains? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone that shouts of, God bless it, God bless it. When the word of the Lord came to me, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of the temple, and his hands, it is promised, would complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. So do you see how God's love works? It's not about coercion. It's about people being persuaded to change. When God works, he does so in love, not in violence most of the time. True, in the Old Testament, there are some battles where God's people do defeat their enemy. But for the most part, God is a God of love and persuasion rather than coercion. And so this Christmas, do we want to grow as people to be open to the Lord and His gentle kind of love and message? Let us not resist, but trust in the Lord and adapt to the realities we are facing. For we are not in control, and if we allow our hearts and minds to be changed, we can be used by God. Mary was minding her own business planning a life with Joshua, when all of a sudden the angel Gabriel showed up and her life went in a completely different and unexpected direction, over which she had no control. Her response was not anger or bitterness, but faith. Luke 1, 38, I am the Lord's servant, Mary said. May your word be fulfilled it to me. Joseph, too, was going to quietly break up with Mary, when she started having a baby that was not his. But when the angel came to him in a dream, telling him that this that he, this son of Mary's was the son of God, and he should take her home as his wife, Joseph trusted and did just as he was instructed. 
And the two of them got to raise the Son of God, the Messiah, who were, and were used by the Lord God in a mighty way. And so finally, as this Christmas is a very different Christmas, let us remember that Jesus Christ has not come to us just back then, but he comes to us today in the sacraments and in worship. And God comes to us in love, and as he comes, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, this is a key for us to understand. As we worship and trust, we don't need to change God to love us. We are to be changed by loving God. So just as Mary and Joseph adapted to their callings, let us be open to adapting to our callings in this day of in this day and in this generation. Let us pray. Please, Lord, as you came to earth in Jesus 2,000 years ago, you are still coming to us now in the water of baptism and the blood of communion, the sacraments. And, of course, by the presence of your Holy Spirit. As you lovingly and gently come to us in love and not in coercion, Help us to willingly trust and adapt to follow you, even as Mary jo and Joseph did on that first Christmas. They, are ch they were changed in and through their worship. Let us, similarly, be shaped by this worship. We ask this in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer with our needs. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you on this fourth Sunday of Advent seeking your help in growing in your kind of deep and sacrificial love, but a love that is very gentle. We ask for your help through this strange Advent and Christmas season. Bless the virtual community Christmas concert that's coming out today 
that will help that it will help people to better enter into the Christmas spirit in this very unusual year. And so, Lord, please bless us and help us, especially here in Ontario as we face higher numbers of COVID-19 cases. We pray for all our frontline workers and their families, especially those that have been getting sick recently. We also pray for wisdom, that we would be careful in this season to help stop the spread of this virus. And we pray for all levels of our government, municipal, provincial, federal, and we also remember even Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and her family. Meanwhile, God, keep on blessing and protecting our schools. And as they'll be taking a break starting tomorrow for a couple of weeks, keep all of the students safe at home that they don't end up spreading the virus around. And may they go back after the holidays to have a safe holiday, but be ready to learn again in January. Lord, we continue to pray for the ministries of our two churches, especially as the Adullam Camps has given us this program called Road to Christmas. May it help many young families find you, Jesus, in this Christmas season. We continue to pray for those dealing with health problems, especially cancer. And so we pray for Frank, and we pray for Blossom, we pray for Lisa. We also pray for John's sister Louise, and we also pray for Joe from a neighboring congregation who's currently in hospital. We also pray for John, a friend of my family's, who was saw recently at the cancer clinic. Meanwhile, God, we continue to pray for Bill. We continue to pray for Mavis as she recovers, doing therapy as much as three times a day. We pray for Karen's cousin, Carolyn, who's in hospital recovering from a diabetes and a stroke, and hopefully she's getting home this quite soon. We also think of Rob and his family who are dealing with diabetes and dialysis. Keep him and them safe and guide the doctors at this time of year. We also pray for those um, like my son Ryan who are dealing with some ongoing issues. It seems like he's starting to feel a little bit better as the medication goes down. We thank you for the doctor's attention this week and the reports to, to encourage us that once he gets the medications reduced, this should all pass and he should get feeling back to normal again. Meanwhile, God, we continue to pray for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, especially at this Christmas season. It's often a time of family. Be with those who are missing a loved one, whether it's a recent loss or even a loss from many years ago. Holy Spirit, bring them strength and hope as only you can bring. We also pray for those who find this time of year difficult for various reasons. Give them a special sense of your grace and help. Meanwhile, Lord, hear our prayers as we lift you any specific concerns that we have upon our hearts and minds. Lord, hear our silent prayers. In closing, God, I thank you for Nathalie and how she's come through her surgery very well. Help her to continue to recover well and get home from the hospital in a timely manner. We ask this all in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.